gathering so that we could ride and uh, prayer so that we stop the pipeline from being put underneath the Missouri River just north of our reservation boundary. Two years ago when I found out they were going to build this pipeline right outside my door, I thought, how could they do that? How could they not talk to me? This is very sacred land. The Holy Hills of the Mandan are right here, the Okipa sites here, the sacred rocks that are here that tell us our futures, they're all right here. I drove two days to Standing Rock, to the main Dapple resistance camp, all the while thinking of Black Elk's great vision atop a sacred peak in the Black Hills of the Lakota Sioux people. I remember reading in the classic book, Black Elk Speaks, of the great sadness that this Sioux holy man had carried into his old age. He pondered his great vision that came to him when he was only nine years old and which had not yet come to pass. I was standing on the highest mountain of them all and around about beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. And when I stood there, I saw more than I can tell and understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in a secret manner the shapes of all things in the spirit, and the shapes of all shapes as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the secret hoop of my people was many hoops that made one circle white as daylight and as starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children, one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy. And I, to whom so great a vision was given in my youth, you see me now a pitiful old man who has done nothing for the nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer. And the secret tree is dead. In the dark of night, I drove into the Ocheti Shakoan camp near the confluence of the Cannonball and Missouri Rivers at the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. I was thinking that the late hour might prove to be an inconvenience to the people of the camp, but I was delighted to be greeted with great warmth by a Lakota man at the camp's entrance. I found a place to park among tents and teepees and angled the car so as not to look directly into the glaring spotlights that the militarized police force had installed on the hillside in order to surveil the camp's activities. Crawling into the double layer sleeping bag laid out in the back of my car, it didn't take me long to be lulled asleep by the aromas of burning sage and cedar and the wood smoke from many campfires around me. The next morning, I awoke at around 5 a.m. to Lakota morning chants for greeting the sun and imbuing the day with sacredness. This morning was filled with wood chopping, cooking, erecting many donated Mongolian-style yurts, and the building of simple permanent structures for the large number of people who plan to live through the very cold winter in safety and some semblance of comfort. I had brought along donations provided by Santa Fe friends, consisting of warm clothes 
and a container of food for the main volunteer kitchen. Also for the camp's legal group, media program, food, building supplies, and medical supplies. A large crowd had gathered around the sacred fire with more chanting and prayers sent forth for all people, even for the police. Men drew closer to the sacred fire for the pipe ceremony. Each day, a new group of people arrived. All the way from Alaska, the women protect the stand with solidarity. One day, there was a group of indigenous peoples from Alaska, represented by women. They entered our circle at the sacred fire, singing, and presented the camp a gift, a banner that the women had created. Each woman spoke to us in their native language about women as water and the importance of water on our Mother Earth and in our lives. Under threat, especially with climate change, the polar bear in the north, the ice is melting. They can't hunt no more because they don't have habitat, which is the ice with climate change. Climate change is wreaking havoc in Alaska. In the southern part, you see the salmon. Many of our nations are salmon people. We live from the waters and the salmon provide everything we need. Many of our waterways are also under threat from extractive industries. We're the ones that are being regulated, and the state tells us we cannot fish for salmon when the numbers are low. Meanwhile, commercial fishermen are taking the salmon as bycatch. They're not regulating them, they're regulating the people. They led us to the river to a water ceremony where each of us made a prayer to the river with tobacco and cedar offerings and deposited water which they carried with them from their sacred rivers and which we each were blessed to drink. And they sang and spoke in their native languages. Signs were everywhere. No drugs or alcohol, no guns or weapons. And this is a camp of prayer, ceremony, and healing. From morning to late at night, a loudspeaker rang out sacred songs and welcoming wishes to new guests as more and more people arrived. I heard one day that the count was up to 2,000 people residing at the Ocheti Shakoan camp, and all were working together and helping each other in prayer and ceremony with the most beautiful sense of harmony. In the afternoons and evenings, there were Anipi sweat lodge ceremonies being conducted, some for women, some for two-spirit people, some for men. All people were honored no matter their color of skin, sexual orientation or gender, everyone was friendly, ready to smile, to answer questions, or to simply get to know you. Such an incredible experience of seeing all of these groups. I felt so happy being at the camp and seeing the joy on the faces of everyone, especially the young people. It was a joy knowing that divinity is not just in the hands of the Creator, but also imbued within the sky, within every person, every tree, every animal, every stone, and in water of life herself. It was a joy with a purpose, that of creating community and a new kind of family based on spirit and love, qualities that our materialistic society cannot offer our young people. The main camp is situated not far from the location where DAPL was poised to sink their pipeline, carrying the dirtiest to frack crude oil under the Great Missouri River, which serves millions of people downstream with clean, precious water. 
the Army Corps of Engineers has placed a temporary hold on the pipeline construction, stopping the work temporarily in order to research its environmental impact and hope against hope to find an alternative route. But here at the camp, we know that these are just words amid the trucks and bulldozers still active along the Cannonball River. The Lakota elders speak of a prophecy that was handed down through generations regarding a giant black snake that would slither across their lands and threaten Mother Earth. They feel certain that this oil pipeline is that endangering black snake, for there is always the likelihood that the pipeline could break. What happens when that breaks? What happens to this? What happens to our water? It's, it's like the same old story with the government and the agencies and big oil. We're, we don't matter. So we have to fight to live. Water is life being the common refrain by the protectors, has brought people from over 200 Indian nations together at the Standing Rock camps. Lord, as we stand in solidarity across this land and across this nation. In fact, people of all nationalities and heritage, red, white, yellow, and black, have arrived from the four corners of the world to join the Lakota in their effort to protect their sacred sites and waters, not as protesters, but as water protectors. This cause has awakened a common cord that links with hearts in many contemporary environmental and social justice movements. We just came back from Washington, D.C., our 2,000-mile mi relay run. We stand! We stand! For water! For water! For life! For life! In the afternoon, I climbed the media hill, rising above the camp to the west. While looking out over the camp, I considered the sacrifice and selfless intention of the native people in residence, people for whom this was a movement in service to the life of their world, while at the same time reviving their culture and values. They were those very circles of indigenous peoples whose possible demise Black Elk had so lamented in his later years. So can I live, or will you take my life away from me? Their diary, it's just been like a dream. Only thing is, is it turned into a nightmare. I used to see everything crystal clear, but now I don't. I see the bodies hit the floor. Now homies taking over this world, and war is nothing new. If we get new, everyone already knew. There's no going back to the peace and love. It's just drugs and the thugs. We're killing each other. What happened to helping each other or respecting your mother that no longer exists? What's stopping me from exiting and my soul turning into mist? It is what it is. I don't even think I'll be missed because there's a whole wall of kids waiting to be found. Lost like my mind is. Ways your savior now. We're running out of time. You go through a lot of tribulations here, you know, each and every day. There's challenges. You got to have that base. You got to have your base. In and spirituality and prayer in order to keep you strong mentally, physically, emotionally, you know, so you call upon that every day through the people you meet, things that you do and the teachings that you have. The next day, I attended an orientation for peaceful direct action, which prepares one to join in as a peaceful water protector. So respect each other, pray for each other, even pray for that helicopter that he's safe. Pray for all of the pipeliners who are infiltrating our camp so that their spirit will be shown. We were told how to protect ourselves from mace and tear gas and how to not ultimately resist the police and drilling company 
security. But what was most impressive to me was that these acts were fully informed by ceremony and prayer. Prayer even for the police. Prayer for the men using bulldozer equipment. We stand beneath the outstretched branches of the great tree of peace and invite all nations to join us as we cry out for the master of life to bring his justice, unity, and peace over Standing Rock and all of the Americas. My name is Olive. Um, I come from various parts of Appalachia, my family for generations, but mostly West Virginia. That's where my Cherokee ancestry comes from. And my uh, Wee Wong Yang Wachipi, my Sundance family, lives in southern Colorado. And I've heard that you've been in jail quite a few times. How many, how many times is uh, that? Twice so far. Officers, back up, back up. You need to get off the pickup and you need to go south. You're going to get sprayed with pepper. When we go to jail, it's colonization 101. The origin of the police was res police and keeping slaves in line. So when we're going out here, like we're just dealing with like modern day colonialism. Come on, join me. Oh, We're at the uh, Ocheti Sakoan uh, overflow camp, the main camp. This is like technically, it's stolen land, it's treaty land, but it's referred to legally as Army Corps of Engineer land, where we're at right now. How long have you been here? Uh, uh, over, a, a, over a month and a half, and I'll be here for the long haul. Yeah. What do you feel all of this action is about? What can it bring for all of us? Well, it's long overdue for us to stop the self-sabotage of our species. And um, so us being here, I know, I, especially for, for the women, I feel like in a lot of ways it's us like we're taking our wombs back. Genocide and ecocide always go hand in hand. Rape is always a form of, uh, you know, warfare and genocide. As Andrew Jackson said, rape the native out of everybody, you know? And that's another thing that ties into, like, you know, sexual assault in, in jail. It all ties into that, like, keeping up, you know, um, genocide and colonialism through stealing the womb from women. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a really big thing about us coming here. Um, women and grandmothers having such a big part to play in like decolonizing ourselves in that ways that we're taking taking back our wounds. Um, but for us here, it's just us acknowledging that it's like this is a pandemic that we're dealing with. This is not a localized issue. Even the fact when you contaminate the water, it's, that's not localized. That literally like you know spreads spreads all over the place. So where this pipeline is being laid down because it's dealing with indigenous land, it is an indigenous led movement. This is a uh, not something that just started with this pipeline, you know, this is some, this is like hundreds of years worth of, um, you know, colonization that we're fighting against. And you're a brave woman and a wonderful example for all of us. Well, thank you. I wouldn't thank be, you, you know, so I'm, just a, I'm just a spec, you know, I wouldn't be anything without the camp, you know, strength in numbers. Well, strength in women also. I hope. I hope. <laughs> Certainly this movement is the Native Americans' Gandhi-like, nonviolent civil protest of our time. One morning at our collective breakfast gathering, there was a rumble through the crowd with news that 500 National Guard troops would be descending. You must leave all private property and open all public roads and bridges immediately. If you do not comply, you will be arrested for violations of North Dakota laws. Please disperse now. And that the Lakota elders would send all women and children out of the camp. Was this a warning echo from the past when the last ghost dance was held on Lakota land, drawing together the original peoples in a spiritual revival of hope? after the initial years of reservation, incarceration. Was it a cautionary reminder of how the Sioux Ghost Dance panicked the government in 1890 on seeing its massive numbers gathered? This act prompted Custer's reconstructed regiment 
to massacre almost every single person. Even babies nursing at the breast of their dead mothers as the snow covered them both and froze them in the mother's own life's blood. The next day was Veterans Day and upwards of 700 veterans arrived and held a ceremony with us. Another day, elders from various Native American communities arrived at camp and spoke to the meaning of all indigenous peoples of working together, of their challenges such as deforestation of tribal lands, mining and oil exploration, and of letting go of their past differences in order to come together in unity. The road is lined with flags from all over the world, representing many indigenous nations and organizations of healing and sustainability. I remember years ago being taken by the 103-year-old Hopi sage, Grandfather David, to their prophecy rock. He explained to me, running his aged finger along a weathered line carved in the sandstone boulder leading to a fork in the line. Here is where we have a choice, a choice to either completely destroy ourselves or to effect the renewal of our way of life. Could today's many crises be bringing us to that fork in the road of life, that moment and choice between needless deaths or the renewal of life? I see such a spiritual renewal taking place right here, right now. I am filled with spirit, joy, and inspiration for what is possible at this time on our planet. Perhaps I am having a glimpse of what life was like among the Lakota and other original peoples in North America before the European invasion and colonization. This land of the Great Plains is claimed by the Lakotas of their very own. We are of the soil, and the soil is for us. We love the birds and the beasts that grow with us on this soil. They drank the same water we did and breathed the same air. We are all one in nature. There was in our hearts a great peace and a willing kindness for all living things. The Standing Rock Lakota camps are model communities for the continuance of life and harmony for all beings on Mother Earth. And in this lies hope for our future. As I witness these happenings here at the camp, as this gathering grows increasingly larger, I share many Lakota's feelings that Black Elk's vision is, for us today, a renewed beholding of the harmonious hoop of the world, in which many hoops of nations come together as one. If he could only see this movement now, for his grand vision is coming to pass in the seventh generation since he had beheld it. All the circles which Black Elk spoke of have come together in this encampment and continues with the efforts of individuals and grassroots organizations worldwide in fulfillment of his vision. Their common mission lies in protecting the waters of the world and in revitalizing the indigenous vision and ways of life, which hold crucial guidance to survival of all life and of our Mother Earth, 
herself. What has happened was empowerment of people. People standing up saying, I want to change. Nonviolent direct action is our civil rights. Civil disobedience when things are not going right. This has to be something that spreads, spreads across the world. We have been in a battle. And everything that our dear veterans went through, the people on the front line went through. It's um, hard to talk about some of the stuff that we've seen or some of the stuff that people went through. How do we create a better world? Each day we go forward to do our best so that the next generation has something to live for. Continue to stand up because it's our world, our water, our lives, and our future. And so for me, Sacred Stone lives forever. We've just begun. We've just begun.